Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning to those on the West Coast. Um, my name is Michael Durham. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I work for the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council here in Nashville, Tennessee. I want to just start before we do anything else by acknowledging the intensity of the world that we're living in. Um, we are living in an escalated, traumatizing environment. And I know that many of us are really weary at this point, seven months on uh, into this pandemic. So I just want to say thank you for showing up um, and thank you for the work that you do in the broader movement to end homelessness and for social justice. And I just, uh, just want to acknowledge that uh, I continue to do the work that I do because you keep doing the work that you're doing. So I just really appreciate you. So there are a few things I want to say before we jump into our conversation today. Um, on the screen is a HRSA disclaimer that they want me to show you. Um, so this session is part of our kind of weekly uh, coffee chat series, um, kind of because there's not one scheduled for next week yet. Um, and we call them coffee chats because they're meant to be informal conversations. We encourage you to grab your coffee as I have mine or your breakfast, or your lunch, uh, or whatever beverage of choice, um, and just sit with us for a bit. Um, and I would like to request uh, your attention and presence for the next hour. Um, you'll see a chat box at the bottom of your screen. I think it's at the bottom for you all. Um, I would encourage you to go ahead and start introducing yourself. Um, where are you in the country? What kind of program are you with? Um, and, uh, and then use that chat box throughout the discussion today to interact with one another and the panelists. Um, we are here to learn from each other as much as from the panel. Um, so if you are doing really interesting work on this topic, we uh, invite you to tell us all about it in the chat box. Uh, and that's also where you can uh, identify any uh, technical difficulties you may be having and uh, Brandon De La Cruz will help you out. So I think that's all that we need to say by way of introductions. But so first, we're going to do three polls where I invite all of you to tell us uh, a little bit about who you are. So Brandon, if you can bring the first poll up on the screen. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. So the first question is, what kind of organization are you with? Um, we know it's here at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council our uh, primary focus is healthcare for the homeless programs, but uh, the nature of this work is uh, inherently interdisciplinary and broad, so uh, you may belong to any kind of organization. Just take a few more moments to tell us what kind of organization you're with. open a few more seconds. Looks like we've just got folks from shelters, COCs, healthcare for the homeless programs, one health center that's not healthcare for the homeless, and other kinds of healthcare nonprofits. Great. Thank you. And I think the next poll asks you where you are in the country. And as I was putting this together, I was like, I feel like I'm forgetting a part of the country. So if I overlook something, please tell me in the chat. Looks like most folks on the West Coast, good morning to you. A few folks, handful in the Midwest. Another handful in the Northeast, just a couple in other areas. We're all in the contiguous United States, it looks like. Thank you. And then our last question here uh, asks um, about the status of mobile showers in your community. So we, the, the answers are yes, and my organization runs them. Um, yes, but another organization runs them, or nope, we got no showers. 
And that's why you're here. Just less than half says yes, and my organization runs them. Um, so, <laughs> um, thank you, Cynthia. Nope, we got no mobile showers. Um, so it's a pretty even split. Um, and I'm, I, I want to ask all of you who said that yes, you and your organization runs the showers to uh, tell us all about your program, um, the ins and outs of it in the chat as we move along. All right, thank you, Brandon. So um, I'll spend almost no time on this because I think that uh, the context is pretty clear for most of us. Um, but it's the tragic reality that COVID is going to be with us for a long time. Um, even if a vaccine is made available soon, it'll take a long time for uh, it to be widespread. Um, and so we have to adapt to this new reality. Um, and correspondingly, uh, even before the pandemic, especially in West Coast cities where a uh, plurality of y'all are, um, unsheltered homelessness was uh, skyrocketing. And uh, homelessness in general, according to the PID count, has been rising over the last three or four years. Um, after like seven years of declining. Um, but now in the midst of the pandemic, the economic downturn that associated with the mass evictions that we're expecting, uh, we are uh, anticipating a huge spike, um, which is uh, really concerning for us. So as long as people are sleeping outside, we have to bring hygiene services and showers especially to those people. Um, and that's especially when day centers, libraries, other services where people normally can go inside for the day uh, remain closed or decompressed. So um, that's the context, um, and that's uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So without further ado, I want to acknowledge our panelists. Friends, I did not give you a heads up about this Portlandia joke, uh, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> so uh, we are. Uh, we know that uh, mobile showers look different in every community, but um, but we're going to hear just from one today and then ha hopefully have an active discussion. So, uh, Mike, I'd like to ask you to introduce, introduce yourself first um, and then talk a little bit about C3PO. Hi. Um, my name is Mike Sandell. Um, do, how do I put my... Um, presentation up. We're seeing the slides. Hmm. I'm the only slides I'm seeing of a slide from your um, presentation. Uh, well, um, I think the rest of us okay. are seeing the slide that says Mike Sandell at the top. Okay. Um, I can open it up on my computer, which is here in front of me, just so I can follow along. Um, and then I can have you uh, advance the slides as I need to. Okay. Um, that's unfortunate, but I don't want to spend too much time trying to fix it. Um, so, yeah, my name is Mike Sandell. Um, my pronouns are he and him. I um, was the Camp Life Coordinator um, for C3PO's Queer Affinity Camp, um, and I was also the Accessibility Coordinator for all of C3PO. Um, so as the Camp Life Coordinator, I was facilitating kind of the day-to-day -day needs of the Queer Affinity Camp, um, kind of meals, intake, um, sanitation, um, resident engagement with the program, making sure they understood C3PO and kind of what we were and the rules and such. Um, and as the accessibility coordinator, um, I advocated for the disabled residents. Um, a lot of folks needed mobility devices. Um, we had a lot of diabetics that weren't getting their needs met by um, the meals that were provided. And so I had to go in the community and advocate for that. Um, for, for diabetes-friendly food. Um, I also, and this is why I'm here, built um, solar showers for all three of the C3PO camps. 
Um, so the next slide, I talk about so slide three, I'm sorry. So it's what is C3PO? Um, yeah, it's creating conscious communities with people outside. Um, it's a coalition of several Portland nonprofits working together with officials from the city of Portland and Multnomah County um, to create outdoor camps to give people experiencing homelessness a place to stay during the COVID-19 emergency. Um, we had toilets, food, showers, uh, we had laundry, housing case management, uh, we had some medical care, and hygiene supplies were provided for folks. Uh, slide four, a little bit more about speed review. Ah, there it is. Now I can see it. Yay. Yay. So, yes. Um, there were three camps. Um, two camps were identity specific. Uh, one was for black and indigenous people of color. We called it BIPOC. Um, and the other identity-specific camp, uh, they were right across the street from each other, was specifically for LGBT people. We called it QA or queer affinity. Uh, there was a third camp for folks who didn't fall into either one of those categories. It was mostly couples. Um, we called it Old Town. And they changed their name now. It's called Old Town. Um, and named after the, the neighborhood of Portland it's located in. Um, and these camps are run according to what is known as the village model. Um, let's see here, can I advance my own slide? All right, yes, I can. Um, so in the village model, residents make um, nearly all of the decisions regarding the camp. Um, they're responsible for creation and enforcement of communally agreed upon rules, um, responsible for their own intake processes. Um, and they do work such as sanitation, food service, and security shifts in exchange for their spot. Um, each village has at least two villagers working security at all times. And once a week, each camp has a mandatory meeting where residents come together to address problems and make decisions regarding their camp. Uh, this is where most of the rules that residents have to follow get created. This is, of course, in stark contrast to traditional shelters um, where residents have no say in how the program is run. Uh, this fosters kind of a sense of community among residents and also allows for a more equitable rule enforcement process. Um, and so that was how we ran C3PO. Um, before I well, before I move on to showers, do we want to give folks a chance to ask questions as I go along, or would you rather I wait until after Sandra has presented so we can both ask questions together? What would you prefer, Michael? Let's just wait until after Sandra's Cool. All righty, yeah. Um, so folks could either write their questions in the chat or write them down so they could um, ask them later. That'd be awesome. Um, so C3PO, we had two kinds of shower um, at each camp. Each camp had a shower trailer, and each camp had a solar shower. So the two affinity camps that were right across the street from each other on the east side of the river, of the river we called them the east side camps. Um, those two camps were provided and serviced by an organization in Portland called Rapid Response. Um, the water for those camps came from a fire hydrant, and it was heated by propane. The city donated propane. Uh, and the gray water, the, the water that comes off you when you shower, um, is pumped into a holding tank, and then every so often rapid response would come and empty the holding tank. It usually ended up being, oh, at, at least twice a week that rapid response had to come and pump it. Um, and the solar showers, so unfortunately, the solar showers were destroyed in a windstorm, so I don't have any pictures of the finished showers. Um, yeah, I didn't get a chance to take any pictures before they were destroyed, but um, the way it worked was they, there's this picture that I just found on the internet. So it's a big bag made of vinyl, and you lay it out in the sun, and the sun heats the water inside over a period of a couple hours. Um, and so then you, you hang it up, and you use that water to shower with. Um, we had created a, a little tent 
that folks could go in and for privacy and shower. All right, and the solar shower itself was a 10 by 10 canopy with tarps zip tied to the sides for walls. Um, we had one side that was left untied for a door, and it was just um, velcroed shut. Uh, inside, we had a kiddie pool. We had gotten a, a shower chair um, for disabled folks who needed to be able to sit while they were showering, like folks in wheelchairs and such. Um, and then there was an eight foot two by four. We just set it in a bucket of concrete, drove a hole, put an eye bolt in, um, and then the, the bag hung from that eye bolt. Um, and the hose that you see in this picture is gravity fed. You see that it's at the base of the bag. Um, and so as long as the bag is above your head, um, you just open the valve and the water comes out. Uh, and those bags, one, both the one that's pictured and the one we had, had a capacity of five gallons. Um, so when folks were done, they would drag the kiddie pool out of the tent and then drag it to the lot where we dumped our gray water. Um, so those are the showers on the east side. Each of these slides are supposed to have titles that I'm not sure if you guys are seeing, but um, yeah, there's showers on the west side of the river um, at Old Town. Um, they also have a solar shower, which exactly the same as the ones um, at QA and BIPOC. Um, but at Old Town, instead of small shower trailers that only had one or two showers in it, um, Old Town had a much larger trailer that was built by an organization called Cascadia Clusters. Um, it included laundry units in addition to three showers. Uh, we had more people at Old Town, um, so it just made sense equity-wise that they got the larger trailer um, with, with the three showers. Um, so the water for the, for the trailer on the west side came from a spigot, um, also heated by propane that the city provided. Uh, the difference with the trailer on the west side, though, um, was that it drained directly into the sewer, so it didn't have to be pumped. Um, so this slide doesn't make a whole lot of sense without the title. This is the pros and cons of the, um, oh dear, I've lost track on my computer, the pros and cons of the shower trailers. Um, so the nice thing about the trailers Excuse me, I'm reading from the script here. The biggest issue with the trailers is that they were inaccessible. Um, they weren't rated for power chairs. Uh, they were too small, and there weren't even shower benches in them um, when they first came to us. Rapid Response did eventually install benches at the east side camp trailers, but they were confusing to maintain. The water temperature fluctuated wildly, and when something went wrong, we had to wait for Rapid Response to come fix it because they were so complicated. Um, However, the trailers did have much better water pressure, and the water was hot immediately. Uh, we didn't have to deal with the gray water in the trailers, and they could be used any time of day or night, regardless of weather. They also survived the windstorm. They were one of the few things that actually did survive the windstorm. Um, and then here's pros and cons of the solar showers. Uh, so when we designed the solar showers, it was specifically with wheelchair users in mind. We made sure that the solar showers were as accessible as possible. That was our, our biggest priority with these solar showers. Um, and because it was literally just a bag of water on a post, the solar showers were much, much easier to maintain. We didn't have to wait for a rapid response or any other organization like Cascadia Clusters to come fix them. Uh, the water temperature was consistent with no fluctuations, and uh, but unfortunately, because the hose was gravity fed, the water pressure was very low, um, and dealing with the gray water was a nightmare. Originally, we had the idea of pumping it into a bucket and then dumping the bucket, but we couldn't find an appropriate pump, so we just ended up dumping the kiddie pool. Um, but the the plastic kiddie pool that we ended up getting was so flimsy that it took three people to dump it 
um, without spilling grave water everywhere, because if just one person or two people did it, it would buckle. Um, and then additionally, the way the shower bag worked, it took several hours for the water to get hot, and especially in Portland where it's overcast or not very warm out, it did take many hours for the water to heat. Um, and as I've mentioned, the whole thing got destroyed in the windstorm. Um, the tent did, the post, I don't know where the post went, but the tent, the tarps, everything got destroyed in the windstorm. Um, and so the city contracted with various companies for our utilities, um, United Site Services serviced our porta potties, um, Hollywood Lights provided electricity. Uh, the city gave the camps on the east side laundry cards um, to get their laundry done at Belmont Eco Laundry because the east side camps, or excuse me, the west side camps, um, Old Town, had a washer and dryer on site that was provided by Cascadia Clusters. Uh, we also offered housing case management through JOIN. They had a housing worker that would come by on occasion to help folks apply for housing. And they gave folks checks to get their IDs um, because I'm sure I don't have to tell you that folks not having IDs is a, a big barrier for a lot of houseless people. Um, food. It was coordinated by the city, came from local nonprofits. Um, someone from the city's printing and distribution center would come and deliver breakfast and dinner, and lunch was rotated among three different providers. Um, hygiene supplies were coordinated by um, our lovely Old Town Camp Life coordinator, Jordana McIntyre, um, who was the glue of all of C3PO. They're great. Um, they were, well, are the inventory coordinator for all three camps. Um, the Supplies themselves came from a number of organizations, including Park Med Emergency Preparedness and Snack Block, as well as the City County Joint Office of Homeless Services. Um, the medical program uh, has gotten some new funding and changed their structure a bit since I left. Um, but when I left, and what I believe has sustained, um, is that we had folks come by regularly from an organization called Portland Street Medicine. Um, they're a group of medical professionals who do street outreach here in Portland. Um, they have regular day jobs at hospitals and clinics, and during their off hours they go in their big fancy van out to various camps and provide like abscess care and uh, diabetes care and other, other stuff that folks need. Um, we also had several street medics who would come by. Uh, in addition to, we have referrals to motels. Um, who, if, God forbid, someone should get COVID, they had a place to, to quarantine and isolate. Uh, we also had access to Project Respond. Uh, it's an organization that assists with individuals experiencing mental health crises. It is um, run through Cascadia behavioral health care here in Portland. Um, so partnerships for the trailers. Um, the city of Portland provided water and propane for the trailers. Rapid Response provided and maintained the trailers themselves, and they disposed of gray water on the east side. Um, and Cascadia Clusters built the shower trailer at Old Town. and partnerships for the solar showers. Um, once we got permission from the city to dump the gray water onto the lot that was adjacent to the uh, camps on the east side, uh, we got a grant from PDX Trans Housing and Pride Northwest. They funded the showers with a grant of $2,000. Um, and kind of some challenges that we experienced. Um, we went back and forth for a long time on how to best dispose of the gray water that was easiest, easily the biggest um, logistical hiccup. The city finally gave us permission to jump, dump on the adjacent lot on the east side, and at the Old Town Camp we decided to collect the water in a bucket and dump it into the porta potty tank. Uh, the biggest challenge with these showers was actually getting the materials to the sites. 
I was doing this essentially by myself, and I do not drive. So getting materials like two by fours and sheets of plywood all the way from Home Depot or Lowe's was kind of a nightmare because each time I would need to go to the store to get supplies, I would have to organize a ride from someone to get me there first. Um, and honestly, that was the reason the construction itself took so long. Um, and then once, once we did get all the supplies, finding somebody who kind of knew what they were doing about you know, how to actually build things um, was, was a challenge as well because I have no building experience and we didn't have um, any campers that did either. Uh, and then when we finally got the showers built, um, I mean, we're in the Pacific Northwest, so, you know, the, the overcast and the cloudy um, weather meant that the bags took, took several hours to heat up. Um, so this slide is supposed to be titled, So You Want to Build a Solar Shower. I don't know if y'all are able to see it, but um, there's several things that you need to consider if you're going to build a solar shower, but among the biggest is gray water disposal. Um, improper disposal of gray water can result in a hefty fine if you get caught. Um, so definitely look up the laws in your local municipality regarding that, um, especially if you are on the coast, either west or east, I, like I know a lot of people are, just dumping the water into like a storm drain can be a huge fine because then that gross water often will go into rivers, lakes, streams, and the ocean. Um, so figure out what your local laws say about that. Um, you also need to figure out where you're going to fill the bags because the solar shower definitely needs to be at least a five gallon capacity. They make larger ones, but I would say at least five gallons. Um, so you need to figure out where you're going to get that much water on a consistent basis. Um, probably the most important thing to consider is the weather, though. Um, you know, does it get hot enough, often enough where you are for a solar shower to be able to heat quickly? Um, for other folks in the Pacific Northwest, I saw in the chat there's several folks from Seattle. Um, Solar showers aren't really a great thing in our climate, but if you are in, I saw a couple people from Central California, that's probably a better option for, for your climate. Um, so that's, that's another thing um, to consider because kind of the biggest complaints among homeless people, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, uh, was when they try to access services, they often need to plan their whole day around getting one thing done because they have to wait in line for many hours for, in this case, the shower. Um, if it takes several hours for the water to heat, it kind of defeats the purpose of having an alternative shower to begin with. Like if they have to wait several hours for water to heat for a solar shower, or if they have to wait several hours in line to get a traditional shower, there's kind of no point in having a solar shower. Um, and one last thing to consider is privacy. Um, especially for femme presenting folks and trans people, safety when showering is a huge, huge concern. Um, a lot of folks may just not feel safe showering when the only walls that they have are made of tarps. Alrighty, um, so conclusion. Um, in conclusion, I'm going to be honest. If you're going to build something for homeless people to shower in, I strongly recommend building a wheelchair accessible trailer. Um, every part of the process of building the solar shower was a logistical nightmare. <laughs> and if we had been given adequate trailers to begin with, um, we could have avoided all the headache. Um, that being said, uh, when you do build this trailer, please keep the needs of disabled people in mind. Um, things like, is the trailer rated for po uh, power chairs, um, which, by the way, can weigh in excess of 300 pounds empty, like not including the people in them. Um, if you install a shower bench or provide a shower chair, um, definitely make sure it has a back for someone to like lean against, and make sure it's rated for at least 400 pounds. Um, consider the different ways in which someone could transfer out of a wheelchair and onto the bench or shower chair, and make sure you design the actual floor plan of the shower 
in such a way that there's enough room for their chair to be out of the way when they're showering. Um, and then definitely make sure that the shower head is, is handheld so folks can reach you know, behind them. Um, but honestly, the best thing to do is if you have disabled clients, just ask them what they need because the best expert on what disabled people need, what accommodations they need, is actually disabled people themselves. And my cat, apparently, who is screaming. Um, so get the feedback um, of the disabled people you serve. Um, show them that, the, that meeting their needs is important to you because when you're disabled and homeless, it often feels like you're forgotten about and treated like an afterthought. Um, so that's, that's important. Um, and also a great resource is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, it's updated every few years, and literally the whole text of ADA is available on multiple websites. Um, and it's a, it's a wealth of information on things like how wide should a ramp or doorway be to accommodate a wheelchair. Um, also has information on things like uh, the turning radius of a chair and if you're like me and not great at geometry, how big should you make the floor plan if you have a chair with you know, X turning radius? Um, so yeah, that is it for me. Um, oh, it looks like this is Sandra's presentation. So I will let Sandra introduce herself. Unless, Michael, you have... Yeah, Mike, thank you so much. Um, just really quick before we uh, shift gears here, um, one like very practical question that uh, somebody asked was how many uh, folks can shower with one solar bag? Yeah. yeah, so five gallons of water is really not a whole lot of water. Um, you know, when you're thinking about when you're, you're showering in a traditional shower, five gallons of water probably goes by in 10 minutes or so. Um, but because the water pressure is so low, um, and because you kind of control the flow, you know, you can open and close the valve. Maybe you can squeeze in two people for a bag um, if you shower it very quickly. Um, but generally, it's, it's a one-use thing, um, especially if you, you know, have very long hair and it takes you a minute to wash your hair or um, anything like that. Great. Thank you. Um, I really appreciated your presentation, so many practical tips, and especially appreciate your advocacy for people with disabilities and uh, that, like you say, are often overlooked in these conversations. Um, and I also want to call attention to some of the active engagement in the chat. Some folks have shared links to where they bought their trailers with nonprofit discounts, some really practical advice here. Um, and then I also noticed somebody from Lava May is uh, in attendance, which is a pretty noteworthy organization that does this work. So thank you for being here. Um, so let's turn it over to Sandra uh, to hear about another Portland partner. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, so interestingly, Mike and I worked together because Hiking for All um, wasn't up and running at the beginning of COVID, and so we ended up um, supporting a lot of the work in the C3PO camps, and we've learned a ton, including how to build a proper ADA trailer. <laughs> So um, I'm Sandra Comstock, um, the Executive Director of Hygiene for All. Uh, we are a hospitality, hygiene, and uh, sanitation and safety hub. Uh, we offer um, attended porta potties, uh, shower trailer, a clean clothing and bedding exchange, uh, a first aid station, and uh, waste management for disposing of household trash. Um, I'm going to go a little bit into detail about our first aid program because um, it's kind of unique and also our clothing and bedding exchange, both of which came out of our conversations over a year and a half with houseless folks. So our first aid uh, pod offers a series of carefully designed first aid packages containing non-prescription items for treating ailments such as skin lesions, cuts, parasites, bruises, coughs, and colds that often can become much more serious problems, including ending up in amputation when things aren't properly treated with really basic health care. Um, we have these packages, we've designed these packages because it makes it easier for people to um, 
to give out something without having to have a whole ton of knowledge about um, you know what to put in a particular or what to give people in a particular situation. So each uh, problem has its own sort of packet that they can hand over to the person and instructions inside which they, they can ask the person to follow at, in the site on, in the pod as they're um, getting cared for. So that way we are also sort of protecting ourselves from liability. Um, this offers, allows us to offer basic first aid without deep first aid knowledge. Um, a second aspect of our program is um, uh, the clean clothing and bedding exchange. So rather than having a laundry service on site, and I'll explain why we, we're not doing that in a little bit, which has to do with the challenges related to individual laundering, we are working in partnership with church groups who um, basically receive, we, when we receive soiled and wet clothing and bedding from our patrons, we then uh, bag those and the churches come and pick them up, launder them and return them, and then we put them back into a sort of used clothing store. So people basically come in, exchange their dirty wet clothing and bedding for clean dry stuff and that allows them to reduce this time significantly in terms of how long it takes for them to get a hold of clean clothing. Um, people wait hours and hours just to get into a, a washer dryer situation and then have to spend another couple hours cleaning and drying their clothes. This is a real problem for reasons that I'll explain in a little bit. Um, so our hub has been designed and is led and run by unsheltered Portlanders who partner with neighborhood volunteers to offer hygiene access from 6 p.m. to midnight um, on a daily basis except for Wednesdays when we're closed. After a year and a half of organizing and fundraising, we'll be finally opening in late November. And our mission is to model and advocate for programs and solutions that increase equitable access to life-sustaining water, sewer, uh, waste management services. Uh, and at every step, we emphasize the self-determination and ingenuity of historically marginalized communities with which we, with whom we work. So, Michael asked me to give a little overview of what's available in Portland right now uh, and what's happened since the pandemic. So, even prior to the pandemic, showers, bathrooms, and laundry options for unsheltered Portlanders were extremely in extremely short supply, as well as um, almost no. Uh, availability of places to dispose of serious household trash. So the city of Portland and its nonprofit prior to COVID um, offered just uh, nine bathrooms that were open 24 hours a day throughout the year. We have park bathrooms that those closed down in the winter and a lot of things are closed after midnight. Um, we had just six organizations offering showers from three to seven hours a day and only four locations for doing free laundry open an average of four hours a day. And like I said, no places to dispose of household trash. Since the pandemic, not including Hygiene for All, four of the seven organizations offering showers have closed. And of those organizations offering showers and laundry, the hours available for doing that laundering and showering have halved. So currently there are two basic strategies aside from the C3PO camp, which is its own sort of thing, and I'm not including shelters here because they can't, they aren't, same thing with C3PO, they aren't available to the broader houses community that's living unsheltered on the street. And currently those strategies have offered, the two strategies for people that are living on the streets are um, a program uh, with PPI and um, Clackamas Service Center that offer laundry and showers and buildings. However, the number of people allowed on site has been reduced to prevent the spread of COVID. Uh, the third program offering showers and laundry um, is Harbor of Hope uh, Shower and Laundry Trucks. We have two of those, which provide services for an average of three to four hours a day, just four days a week, near to where people are camping. So while, sh while offering showers and permanent buildings is cheaper, the, the trucks allow easier access near to where people camp and a lower risk of getting COVID as they are waiting outside and not inside for their services. So Hygiene for All's approach is slightly different. The slide here shows how our hub is organized. Uh, we are located on city-provided property underneath the Morrison Bridge on the central east side of Portland in an area that has few hygiene options. 
nearby. Hiking for Wild's program is situated in the heart of the community and is easily accessible to those camping in areas nearby. Being outdoors and near many unhoused communities lowers the barriers to use, and those waiting to use our services sit outdoors six feet apart with overhead protection from, rain, from the rain provided by the bridge under which we are located. Um, we also have our, our, our shower trailer and the rest of the facility is powered by um, off-grid by, um, by uh, electricity we make uh, using renewable solar and wind power generated on site. And we have a shower trailer, so in the same way that uh, the shower trailers at C3PO work, we receive water from <clears throat> Rapid Response, which is a, a city program, but we're actually going to have to pay for it out of pocket because the city's run out of money, apparently. Um, <laughs> and um, Actually, we use the gray water. Uh, we use the bio biodegradable soap, and we're using the gray water to water the plants and garden that's inside of our facility. So there's like a garden over in the corner on the right, and there's plants all around. It's meant to be a, a space of soap, so not just a utilitarian space, but, but it offers sort of a respite from you know the harshness of outdoors. And especially in a moment when so many of the places that people can go and drop in and be uh, inside and in, in uh, company with others are closed, I think it's really important to have spaces where people can meet safely and without risk of getting COVID. Um, so when you come in through, through the door over here, on, I'm sorry, like uh, over on the top side, um, basically uh, patrons are greeted and seated by a pair of pub ambassadors. Like I said, one ambassador is pay, a paid, trained, unhoused, unsheltered staff member, and the second ambassador is, is a trained, housed volunteer from the neighborhood. So the challenges for offering uh, houseless hygiene and participation and services are large. With the pandemic, showers for our houseless residents are even fewer and farther between. Likewise, after COVID, our houseless community can currently enjoys even fewer options for keeping their clothing and bedding clean and bug-free as laundry options and hours have dwindled. Equally, houseless Portlanders continue to have no place to legally throw away their trash and even and very few options for accessing base, basic first aid, with the exception of, exception of the amazing Old Town Clinic, and which is indoors, and of course, Portland Street Witness, and which is one of our partners, both of, both of which are partners of ours. Um, these barriers to basic hygiene place all Portlanders at risk for COVID, hepatitis A, MRSA, and bed bugs, as well as fungal, strep, staph, and skin infections, and parasites such as scabies, head lice, and body lice. With decreased access to hygiene, our houses residents are experiencing even more public discrimination, exclusion, and shunning from residents and police alike. This, of course, amplifies their experiences of trauma and depression. What we're offering isn't just a place to get services, it's also a place to feel involved and to be recognized for the kinds of things people do to support their community members. So Hygiene for All solution to these growing problems has been to offer a participatory model of houseless designed and run at, uh, hygiene access. Our hygiene hub reflects the hygiene needs and struggles that our houseless constituents face and experience on a daily basis. And that's really important. Like, we didn't just say, okay, we think that the houseless need this, that, and the other thing. We asked people specifically about their needs and struggles. And I think that's really uh, shows in the kinds of programs and the ways that we're offering them. Uh, we identified these needs through in-depth conversation with our house, unhoused members as well as community partners that our unhoused members wanted to include. As mentioned earlier, we're offering showers, first aid, household waste disposal, and a clothing and bedding exchange. And I'm going to go into a little detail on the, why, the whys of including laundry, showers, and first aid together because I think it illustrates the importance of asking people what they need and what their problems and struggles are. Unlike our individual laundering programs that exist in Portland, hygiene, uh, clothing, and bedding exchange allows the community members to immediately exchange dirty items for clean ones. This choice came out of a year and a half worth of weekly focused group conversations in which we found combating illnesses and especially bug-borne bug parasites is exceptionally difficult if you cannot coordinate showering, treatment for lice, lice and bed bugs, 
and immediate access to clean laundry in, in one-stop fashion. Specifically, our members told us that waiting to get treatments for parasites from medical professionals, then signing up and waiting to do laundry, then waiting yet more time to get a shower, made combining these three time-sensitive activities nearly impossible to complete at all at the same time. Community members noted that without the ability to accomplish all three tasks, they frequently found themselves reinfested in short order. <clears throat> For this reason, we designed our program, oops, let me make sure I'm We designed our program to ensure patrons can do all three steps within an hour's time. First aid, um, showers, and getting clean laundry can all take place within just like an hour, hour and a half worth of time. We exchange dirty laundry for clean bedding and clothing rather than requiring patients, uh, pa patrons to wash their items because it saves hours worth of time. This is why we are offering delousing and anti-bed bug medications in the same settings as our showers. With our strategy, we have significantly reduced um, the amount of time and the likelihood that people can actually get this done, not in a days-long ordeal, but rather in short order and a simpler manner. Um, a second part of, of our program that um, came out of the discussions that we had was uh, the specific concerns of our sheltered, unsheltered community members regarding the ways in which housed neighbors failed to grasp the problems, struggles, and hard work involved in meeting basic needs while living on the street. And the, the problems they had in dealing with, um, sorry, angry neighbors and police interventions, uh, which often occur because houseless people see unhoused neighbors as illegitimate interlopers. To build community understanding and lower uh, conflict in policing, our members decided to pair paid unstaff, uh, sorry, paid un unsheltered staff with uh, neighborhood volunteers. The aim was to increase our neighbors and businesses' knowledge of and ties to our unsheltered residents. We believe working side by side increases understanding and friendship, which reduces the tendency of our neighbors to call the police on us and increases interest in solving root problems rather than cleaning up after the fact. So I don't know if I'm on the right slide or not. <laughs> Let me just see here. All right, so in addition to creating opportunities to build deep relationships between housed and unhoused neighbors, Hygiene for All offers workshops and educational forums to neighborhood associations, businesses, and city leaders. Through these activities, we build allyship and understanding that encourages, encourages housed neighbors to advocate for city business and neighborhood uh, responses that improve access to health infrastructure and community connection rather than taking actions that further harm our houseless members and patrons. Tracking hygiene for all impact on health policing and uh, trash and byways cleanup, our paid and sheltered staff do outreach to inform our neighbors and policymakers of how current problems associated with people living and sheltered on the streets can re be resolved by, uh, be better resolved and more cheaply resolved by improving our houses community members' ability to maintain uh, their personal health and hygiene by leveraging the houseless community's health in keeping themselves and their surroundings healthy and sanitary, by proactively reducing the cost of sanitation, hygiene, and safety problems, and by proactively reducing conflict by getting to know one another through our program. And so I'm using data from our work and bringing houses, house and unhoused neighbors into conversation and collaboration. We aim to show how businesses and house neighbors can uh, supportively and more constructively reduce shared problems related to public health, sanitation, and safety. In addition to our on-the-ground programming, Hygiene for All is committed to bringing community partners, experts, and houses community members together who do not often speak to one another through regular conversation and collaboration. A key space of these conversations occurs through hygiene staff and community training with organizations who focus on disrupting racist, sexist, anti-LGBTQ, and ableist harm, increasing mental health awareness, improving houseless health, 
enhancing and enhancing community-led de-escalation and safety practices, and improving public policies and practices governing public safety and health. We are especially committed to specifically addressing covert and overt forms of oppression that affect the houses community as they seek personal health and safety and navigate public and institutional spaces. Hygiene for All's concerted efforts to engage unsheltered residents who are targeted by racism, heteronormativity, and intolerance of mental and physical uh, disability have convinced us that simply prioritizing houseless voices generally is not enough. In addition, we also need to address the role of everyday racism, sexism, anti-LGBTQ, and ableist practices in preventing uh, those most targeted from our community from accessing basic services and in pushing those same people down and in, further down into a, a spiral of chronic houselessness. This is as much a priority to us as providing the infrastructure and services our city currently lacks. In short, our program isn't just about uh, meeting important family needs, it's about leveraging Portland's unsheltered community's experience and know-how. It is equally about expanding opportunities for agency, agency in problem solving, agency in resolving community conflict, and agency for greater participation in civic discussions and plans that address Port Portland's per current housing, hygiene, and sanitation emergencies. I'm going to stop there because I think we're gone way over and there's probably plenty of questions. I had some questions that I think are really important to ask your housing neighbors, but um, hopefully that's kind of obvious from the discussion so far. Thank you so much, Sandra. We've got about eight minutes left. I think this was great. well. Um, I just want to uh, just underscore your points about asking folks what they need. Um, I think that really uh, sets your program apart. And in addition to your just your values rooted in social justice uh, and not charity. Um, I've seen a couple of questions come in uh, throughout, but I encourage everybody to add any additional questions in the chat, uh, not just to the panelists, but to others uh, in the room here. Um, you know, there was a question earlier about risk for overdose when folks are isolated, and this is not unique to providing showers during a pandemic. We know that this is a thing in many healthcare for the homeless programs uh, that folks OD in the bathrooms. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any advice or experience that you think that would be helpful about how to how to mitigate, um, you know, overdoses uh, in mobile showers? Yeah. Well, I mean, for one thing, we are all trained in Narcan, administering Narcan, so that's really important. Um, and we have people on like the way that our our site is set up. I don't know if you can go back to the site site setup, but it's it's. Um, De designed so that basically if you're at the um, first aid pod, which is sort of the center of everything, you can see pretty much everything that's going on in the site that's front of the house where patrons are going to be. Um, in addition, I mean, we do um, check after um, 10 minutes, and then we explain why we're checking after 10 minutes to see if people are okay. And obviously, if they're not responding, we're going to try and get in and um, get get some help going. Um, I thought a lot about how to manage the door situation and making sure that the doors um, uh, are can be opened easily. Um, but I mean, I may, mainly our thing is um, that, that these are attended, that we're constantly watching, where we're making sure that people are um, being safe in the showers and that we um, have the Narcan on site if we need to use it. Mike, anything to add? Yeah, um, so C-3PO, first of all, I apologize. My cat wants to be the star of a show. Um, it's a gift to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, C-3PO, are you kidding me right now, was <laughs> unique in that um, we actually had a safe use site um, on site, um, we had a safe use tent where um, folks were um, allowed to use whatever substance they used. Um, the idea was that they would um, tell either a neighbor 
um, you know, someone whose who's tent was near theirs or um, whoever was on security at the time, hey, I'm going to go use the safe injection facility. Come check on me in 10 minutes if you don't see me come out. Um, and we also had Narcan on site, multiple people trained in it. Um, it was the nasal Narcan that we had, so it, it's the one that's easiest to administer anyway. But we, yeah, anyone who wanted to be trained on it um, could be. And we, as far as I know, um, haven't had a single overdose um, in any of the camps. But what we have done is outside the camps, there's been many overdoses reversed because we have had Narcan on site. Um, what is unique about C3PO is that we also provide services at the gate. So if people are hungry, we can give them food. Um, if people need hygiene supplies and we have an abundance of them, we can give them out. And so we um, kind of develop relationships with the people in the community. And so someone could come to us and be like, oh my God, someone around the corner, they've overdosed, they're not leaving. Um, then we could go and administer the Narcan um, and take care of our community that way. Um, so that was how, how we dealt with that at C3PO. Thank you. Um, just want to call out uh, Susan from Boston's uh, chat uh, that, that I know at Boston Healthcare of the Homeless Program, they have reverse motion detectors uh, in their bathrooms, which has proven really important. I know that your CMO has talked to our uh, council audience uh, several times about those. Um, well, I think we can squeeze in one more question here. Um, and you have addressed this already in some regards, noting the weather in the Pacific Northwest it gets uh, especially rainy. Uh, in the winter. Um, any other advice for those of folks who are uh, thinking about doing this, but winter is coming um, and that poses additional challenges? Mm -hmm. um, well, our, we have a special situation because uh, the piece of property the city has given us is underneath a bridge. <laughs> So that helps a lot, um, and I'm sure that we'll probably be putting up some additional canopy uh, in the waiting area near our site. I think those things are pretty, I mean, you'd have to get a lot of canopy space in order to make it COVID safe. That's the main challenge. Um, so, I mean, I think it's doable. I just think, you know, you have to be willing to buy a lot of canopy <laughs> and have a good number of sandbags that keep them down, right, Mike? <laughs> Oh, in addition, I think, I mean, uh, something that we haven't figured out yet is how to keep people uh, warmish outside of the, the um, first aid pod where there's just two spaces for respite if people need it. Um, we've, like, if you're outside and not underneath a bridge, one thing that we were, we've we been dis um, discussing with the Center for Public Interest Design is what they call, like, a rocket, I don't know, it's, it's like a, a rocket stove or something. I can I can send some information about it. But basically, you can uh, use a very small amount of biomass to heat um, like a bench that sort of uh, radiates warmth um, fairly easily. But we can't do that under the bridge because of uh, the city so doesn't want us lighting fires underneath the bridge. <laughs> Yeah, um, we just invested in a lot of uh, like hand warmers, and people will use those um, not only to warm their hands, but they will like put them in their socks when they sleep, or they'll keep several in their sleeping bag. Um, but yeah, I I left C3PO just as they were starting to uh, winterize, um, so I'm not sure what what ideas they come up with. Yeah, exactly. Hot water bottles is also an option. Um, yeah. Thank you both. Um, I realized I was talking on mute for a second as I was starting to wrap us up. Um, I really want to thank Sandra and Mike for uh, the lots of time that it took to, to prepare for today um, and the presentation itself. Um, we advertised this as being a nuts and bolts kind of session, and I, I think we got a lot of those. Um, 
I want to encourage everyone to stay in touch with the council. There are a lot of ways to do that. The slide includes some of those. You know, I am the technical assistance manager at the council, and what that usually means is connecting folks to one another, and I am happy to do that after we conclude today. When this meeting closes, uh, an evaluation survey should appear in your browser, and I uh, plead with you to complete it so that we can um, uh, learn better uh, how, how to do our work better. So with that, I want to say thank you all for attending, and this session will now close. Thank you.